Add the cinnamon sticks, black peppercorn, green cardamom, cloves, butter. Put in our onions, cook the onions down. That's Moise Subedar, head chef and co-owner of Mila Tandoori Kitchen in the heart of San Francisco's Civic Center District. And he's making every South Asian restaurant staple, chicken tikka masala. Real aficionados, however, don't even call it chicken tikka masala. To them, it's CTM, and that's true all the way from the British Isles to the California coast. Our number one selling item, by far, hands down, is chicken tikka masala. Hey guys, I'm Sana, and today we're exploring the origins of chicken tikka masala, its popularity, and why the future of curry houses across the United Kingdom in particular is under threat. Okay, so the first thing you need to know about CTM is that there's a lot of people who say it's not from South Asia. It's actually British. What? Okay, kind of. Chicken tikka masala's origins are often traced back to Glasgow, Scotland, where a number of restaurants claim to have been the first to cook the dish starting in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. These stories often center around one particular Bengali immigrant and restaurateur by the name of Ali Ahmed Aslam, who ran the Shish Mahal restaurant that still stands today. Reports from the Times say that a customer at Shish Mahal sent back their chicken dish claiming it was too dry or bland. And when it was returned to the chef, he added a marinade consisting of a can of tomato soup, yogurt, and a mixture of spices or masala. Except that might actually not be that accurate either. According to Sean Carey, a researcher who studied curry houses in the UK, CTM's origins are actually a lot more complicated. Some people claim it was uh, its origins lie at the Moti Mahal restaurant in Delhi. Others say Glasgow and others say a Bangladeshi chef invented it somewhere in the UK. I think like all these questions, it's very difficult to know the historical truth. But what I would say is that it's entirely possible that it was simultaneously invented in different parts of the world. Whatever the true story behind chicken tikka masala is, it took off, becoming a signature dish for South Asian restaurants across the UK and the US. The curry industry, we have over 12,000 curry houses, and the curry house itself contributes 4.2 billion to the British economy every year. So it's a very popular. So when chicken tikka masala become number one, it means that uh, the national dish is not fish and chips anymore. In the early 80s, CTM was so popular in the UK that it was being sold pre-packaged at the popular Weight Rose supermarkets. By 2001, the UK's Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, hailed chicken tikka masala as a truly British dish and invention, with the chicken tikka being Indian and the masala being British because the British desired a gravy to be served with their meat. Chicken tikka masala is now a true British national dish. It is a perfect illustration of the way Britain absorbs and adapts external influences. And by 2009, Brits were consuming 2.5 billion pounds of CTM per year, with approximately 65,000 people employed all around the UK in restaurants also known as curry houses. The new migrants that come in very often um, are looking to eat the kinds of foods that they recognize from home. So if you look at supermarkets and that kind of thing, those reflect very often those kind of new tastes. And the food market is a, is a relatively easy one for new groups to enter into. But none of this would have been possible without the migration of South Asians to the UK to begin with. And that's a story in and of itself. And it starts with, you guessed it, colonialism. The British landed on the Indian subcontinent beginning in the late 1600s as merchants, establishing trading posts across a number of cities under what became known as the East India Company. By the mid-1700s, much of India had come under the control of the company, and a century later, India had become a British colony. One notable immigrant to the UK from South Asia was Saki Din Muhammad, who, after becoming a captain with the East India Company, moved to London. There, he established the first Indian restaurant in the UK, known as the Hindustani Coffee House. Sailors, so-called Laskars, from Bengal, who were living in boarding houses, and of course those boarding houses, the men would have been supplied with food. And out of that supply of food started small waterfront cafes. And that's really the origins of the present day Indian curry trade. Fast forward to the 1950s and 60s when immigration laws were eased. During that time, the UK saw a significant increase in the number of South Asian immigrants. And this changes a lot. Mass migration really happens after 1947. 
um, where you start to get smallish numbers through the 50s of migrants coming for work because the UK was looking for kind of labour to, to staff the shortages. And then particularly for South Asians through the 50s and 1960s, and then in larger numbers through the 1970s and 1980s when you get family reunification, particularly from Pakistan and Bangladesh. So that's when you start to get the formation of larger settled communities across the UK, always linked to kind of areas of, of work. Today, the South Asian community in the UK is approximately 5% of the population with visible communities in all major cities, including London, Bradford, Glasgow, Birmingham and Manchester, which is home to the famous Curry Mile. There's also the famous Brick Lane in London's East End. It's the home of the country's Bangladeshi community known as Bangla Town, and it's known for its many curry houses. This area of Bangla Towns was predominantly settled by Bangladeshi families. It's always been a, an incoming area. You've had Jewish people, Irish people, all sorts of people come in here. But while the South Asian community has grown considerably over the decades, it does face a number of political, economic and social challenges, all of which are showcased around curry houses in the UK. Recently, immigration laws have deeply impacted the ability of South Asian restaurants to bring over chefs and waiters from South Asia. This has resulted in a massive shortage of South Asian workers and thus the shutting down of numerous restaurants over the years. And with the lack of South Asian chefs, restaurants have had to hire Eastern European immigrants who now work in curry houses in the thousands. But Brexit threatens even the employment of those workers. Brexit is going to happen very shortly, not, not far to go. And we still don't know what's going to be happen. It's deal or no deal. And the thing is, if you don't have free movement, then those Europeans will be also stopped. And they'll have to have a visa to come to United Kingdom. Brexit is going to be a problem for the catering industry nationwide, but particularly in a place like London, where huge numbers of workers come from overseas. The curry houses are particularly affected because if the children of the restaurateurs are not coming into the industry, you're going to have to pull in people from overseas. Former Secretary of State for International Development Preeti Patel even tried to gain support for Brexit among curry house owners by saying that the UK's withdrawal from the EU would save the industry by keeping Eastern Europeans out and thus prioritizing South Asians for restaurant jobs. The future of curry in this country is at risk because our membership of the U European Union renders us powerless to control our borders. The Brexit campaign was sold to a number of South Asian communities by people that wanted us to leave Europe on the basis that you know, if we weren't tied to Europe, we could expand back into our broader networks of people so that the routes to South Asia, to and from South Asia, would open up. It was a very strongly kind of nostalgic imperial idea that Britain could reconnect with its empire. We are actually struggling for the skill chef, even low-skill um, um, people that needed within the curry industry. So hence, there is like three to four curry houses are closing every week. And that's not a good news for the British economy, neither for the Asian community in the United Kingdom. There's also the changing face of neighborhoods as South Asian communities like the Bangladeshi community struggles to keep their businesses and restaurants open, especially in East London. Because of gentrification, um, they're simply being priced out of the market. And I think also they're being replaced by new incoming forms of food. So somewhere like Brick Lane or the Curry Mile in Manchester, which is very close to here, you'll see those um, traditional Indian restaurants being replaced by kind of shisha places or Lebanese places. And those reflect the churn of those areas because often Indian restaurants are located in areas of high migration and, and high kind of transition. And then there's the straight up racism that South Asian communities have faced for decades. In the 60s and 70s, violent attacks on members of the South Asian community by white skinheads became commonplace, and they were fueled by anti-immigrant rhetoric of the time. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and South Asian communities are once again the target of racism and more specifically Islamophobia following 9-11 and the 7-7 attacks on the London underground. Every day, violence and hostility is extreme, and that's ratcheted up a lot since Brexit. So incidents of Islamophobia in particular um, are, are massively high, but I think that's true across all South Asian communities as well. And in the aftermath of Brexit, another moment of anti-immigrant sentiment, racially motivated hate crimes in the UK spiked to their highest levels ever. And Islamophobic attacks in the UK have also increased by 26% in 2017, with over 1,200 incidents reported. So how do we make sense of this dissonance or disconnect in British society between its ongoing love affair for South Asian cuisine, but also its long and complicated relationship with South Asian immigrant communities. It's always been a kind of very 
global society, its culture and identity has always been global, but it's never been happy with representing itself to itself in that way. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the video. It was pretty yummy to make, I must say. Uh, let us know in the comments what you guys think. What are some of the origin stories that you've heard about chicken tikka masala and what your favorite South Asian dish is? And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week.